is weight reduction with GLP-1 receptor agonists in subjects with obesity without type 2 diabetes. These are my potential conflicts of interest. And next comes the agenda. And I will start a little bit with how the effects of GLP-1 and GIP receptor agonists on appetite, caloric intake, and body weight were discovered. And in fact, this was a German discovery hidden in an abstract book published in 1992. And so four years later, uh, Stephen Bloom and his group published a very prominent paper in Nature on the same effects, injecting GLP-1 into the uh, cerebrospinal liquid and reducing appetite in animals. And since then, we have learned a lot about the mechanisms of body weight reduction through GLP-1. And one of the first uh, papers describe what happens in healthy volunteers when you feed them a breakfast at time zero, satiety goes up, but it is lost over time, but less so, significantly less so, when they are receiving intravenous GLP-1. And then, uh, 270 minutes later, they were asked to eat an ad libitum meal so that the calorie intake could be counted. And in fact, those reporting a higher satiety eight less calories, minus 12% for this particular meal. Other studies have inquired how do GLP-1 receptor agonists interact with the brain in order to do this, and they identified the main location as being the hypothalamus, notably the arcuate nucleus, where there are several types of neurons, some of which have GLP-1 receptors. And the findings were such, yes, GLP-1 receptor agonists can access these GLP-1 receptors in the central nervous system. They can suppress NPY neurons, and this explains the reduced desire to eat. And then projections from the hypothalamus to the brainstem they explain why this is also a mechanism to support not only meal initiation, but also meal termination. And what uh, has been found with GLP-1 can also be described and very significant findings with the agents that we now can use that have been approved for the treatment of obesity. That is, for example, high-dose semaglutide injected at 2.4 milligrams every week. And if you now ask the patients about their hunger, feeling fullness, satiety, how much they would like to eat, this is what you find. Hunger is significantly reduced. Fullness and satiety are increased. Uh, the desire to eat is lower. And if you calculate an overall appetite suppression score, it is higher when you treat and when you then count the energy intake, again, from ad libitum meals, it is much lower with uh, semaglutide treatment compared to placebo. And in, when you start treating and you do a baseline examination and see how much it changes, there is a much higher reduction in calorie intake with semaglutide. So how does that translate uh, into body weight reduction. And here, I will uh, stress, these are patients with obesity, but not diabetes. So typically, body weight is more than 100 kilograms. Body mass index in this study was between 37 and 39, on average, uh, kilograms per meter squared. And they had a normal HbA1c and fasting plasma glucose concentration. So this is the target population. And I'm showing this trial because it compares the two approved agents, semaglutide high dose, liraglutide high dose, higher doses than we would use for the treatment of diabetes, 
where semaglutide is used at a maximum of one milligram per week and liraglutide at a maximum of 1.8 milligrams per day. And you can see that over the duration of the trial, you have a reduction in body weight, which is larger with semaglutide as compared with liraglutide, and you reach a steady state of body weight approximately after a year. You can also appreciate from the lower panel that the response is pretty heterogeneous. So there is a lot of inter-individual variability. I'll come back to that. And you can judge this from the standard deviations that are shown here. Uh, but also it is very obvious, this is no change. You have more change with semaglutide as compared with liraglutide. We should also talk a little bit about, uh, about side effects. So prominently, patients report nausea, 61, 59%, but also with placebo, this is expectations. They also tend to vomit a certain percentage, but this is usually only seen in the beginning of the treatment, and it relatively rarely leads to the discontinuation of the treatment. So semaglutide 3.2% and placebo 3.5% were very similar in that respect. It is important that the pharmacological reduction in body weight is a very good addition to lifestyle uh, management. So if you ask patients to undergo an intensive behavioral program. This is what you see in terms of effectiveness. So six to eight kilograms are lost, but on top, you can achieve more weight reduction when you treat with semaglutide on average like 18 kilograms. And this is uh, identical to saying you have a very realistic chance that the patients will lose uh, 15 or even 20 percent of their initial body weight by being treated in this way. We also have observed in the past years, starting 2006 and now uh, up to the year 2022, that the compounds developed recently are much more potent in terms of weight reduction. This is semaglutide for type 2 diabetes. This is semaglutide as an oral treatment. And this is terzapatide, uh, the most recently developed incretin-based glucose-lowering medication. I want to point to the fact that there are huge inter-individual differences in the quantitative aspects of weight reduction. And you can speak of non-responders. So to make this clear, I'm showing you results from two studies, one comparing semaglutide with placebo and the other one comparing terzapatide at three doses, again with placebo. So basically with placebo, you have approximately 50% of the subjects that lose weight and you have 50% that gain weight and that is the same in the right-hand panel. When you treat with semaglutide, the majority of the subjects reduces body weight, but there is here 10% that will gain weight even while being treated with semaglutide. Of course, it's much more likely that you lose weight, but in the end, the whole range of what happens to body weight is from minus 53 to plus 12%. And with terzapatide, you have a higher proportion reporting weight loss, especially with a higher dose. And you can use minus 53% of your body weight, but there is a minority of patients that will gain weight up to plus 18%. And we have no way of predicting how uh, the patient will respond individually. Next message is long-term treatment is important. This is a study, again, with high-dose semaglutide, and you start treating, and body weight is lost after 20 weeks, more than 10 kilograms on average. And then, per randomization, some people discontinued this treatment, and the body weight tended to go up. 
period was not long enough, but my prediction is it will be ending wherever you had your baseline body weight and only continued semaglutide treatment took you to the new uh, steady state plateau, uh, which was like 18% below baseline body weight. So if you want to have the benefits of this treatment, you ought to continue probably forever. The terzepatite story adds another flavor to the potential mechanisms. And the question now is, is there a role for GIP in the regulation of body weight? And there are animal studies, more than this one that I'm showing here as the graphical abstract, that describe the effects of knocking out mouse or human GIP receptors, maybe more convincing if you inject GIP into the cerebrospinal liquid of mice, then this will reduce body weight and food intake unless you have knocked out the GIP receptor. This also works with a peripheral injection of GIP, uh, but not if there is a knockout of the GIP receptor. And if you are talking about uh, dual agonists addressing GLP-1 and GIP receptors, it gives you greater weight loss in animals that have wild type GLP-1 and GIP receptors. And if you knock out the GIP receptor, you have a reduced effect. So this speaks very much in favor of GIP being an anti-obesity drug and perhaps explaining why terzapatide is so effective. However, in human experiments, and I only show you one, but there are several ones, the blue symbols in the middle, they describe what happens with GIP, exogenous GIP being infused, and it doesn't give you much of a reduction in uh, calorie intake. The GLP-1 infusion does what it has always done in many studies confirming the effect on appetite and caloric intake. And surprisingly, when you add GIP to GLP-1, even the GLP-1 effect, which otherwise is very robust, was no longer there. So here it looks as if humans might be different from mice in that respect. So let me conclude. GLP-1 receptor agonists can reduce body weight considerably. This therapy is successful only as long as patients are exposed to the medications. So don't stop them unless there is a very good reason. The inter-individual variability of weight reduction is high and individual responses cannot be predicted at present. Some patients do not tolerate this treatment and typically discontinue the medication. Over and above weight reduction, Beneficial effects on obesity-associated morbidities have been documented, like improvements in glucose tolerance and prevention of diabetes in pre-diabetic subjects, improvements in liver histology in those with fatty liver disease, especially showing that you can delay the progression of fibrosis. You can improve the number of hypoxia episodes in subjects with sleep apnea syndrome. And you can improve the menstrual cycle, the regularity in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. And also, you see improvements in parameters measuring disease-associated quality of life. So I think GLP-1 receptor agonists for the treatment of obesity are uh, uh, an optimistic uh, story. We know the mechanisms. We have major weight loss that should impact on the health and longevity of the patients. And we will hear more of it uh, in the near future. Thank you very much for your attention.